Okay, well, <clears throat> I think we're going to get started here. So again, thank you all for um, being on the teleconference this, uh, this afternoon. Um, this is Manus Berlakis here, and um, uh, together with um, Erin Armstrong, who will be joining us uh, shortly as well as Santiago Garcia um, uh, from, um, from um, Minneapolis as well as from Denver. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, this uh, last uh, the ACTO Club for the year. We have three cases to show today, and uh, I think you may find them uh, interesting. We had actually pretty, uh, pretty challenging um, pretty challenging treatments, and uh, hope to get your feedback and how we think we could uh, handle those patients. So this is the first case. This is a patient who had a right coronary artery CTO. He had, as you can tell, on the left side, multiple stents in the LAD and the circumflex, but continued to have uh, angina. And he was referred for, um, um, for PCI of the CTO of the right coronary artery. Now, as you can see here, we do have um, a proximal cap, but the distal vessel is relatively small. You have a posterolateral and PDA, but uh, it's a relatively small uh, small vessel. And uh, the PDA is actually mainly a wraparound from the LAD. So any thoughts right now how people approach this? Hey, Manos, Santiago here, I just joined. So hey, you have Santiago here, thanks, thanks for joining. Hey, how are you? This is John, John Joven from Richmond. Hey, hey, John, good morning. Thanks for joining hey. as well. And I see also on the line we have uh, uh, James Rittelmeyer as well as um, Islam Bolad and uh, Chuck Lou as well. So thanks. And I think there's a couple more people I cannot tell who they are, but thanks you all for joining. I didn't see the diagnostic picture. Is that a picture of the right? Let me go back. Yeah, so this is a patient who has a um, right coronary CTO. He has multiple okay. stents in the circumflex as well as the LAD, but continues to have angina, and he was sent for, for PCI of the right coronary CTO. Okay. Now, what is interesting in this uh, areocranial view is that uh, the patient has a um, uh, fairly small distal territory. So I don't know if that's... Um, um, you know what's causing it, but uh, it was challenging to get into there because of the uh, small size of the distal vessel. So, any thoughts or people on how you would uh, tackle this, undergrade, retrograde, etc.? Um, well, I don't feel very excited about that epicardial collateral. I don't think that's something that you can use. Um, <coughs> the uh, Septals, perhaps, I think you can certainly try that. Is there a stent in the LAD? Yes, sir. yes, there is. There is stand. You can see there's yeah. a stand yeah. uh, trailing yeah. those septals, but you can still go through stands, so it's not a big deal. Okay. However, that collateral, your epicardial you mentioned, this is actually not uh, a collateral to the PDA. I think it's an This is the RV margin, all right? Yeah, so sometimes yeah. you can get fooled on that, and in this view it's hard to tell, but this was not a septal going to the PDA, it's septal to the epicardial. Yeah. So, you know, because the distal vessel was small, we decided let's try first a primary retrograde approach. And we did try with surfing, nothing happened. We did try to inject some contrast, and we had very poor connection. So, the long story short, uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, we tried with wires, but couldn't go anywhere. It was a fairly long occlusion. So, soon enough, we switched to the sexual reentry. This is a fine cross, I think, with um, um, a filter XT or a, or a Pilot 200. I think it's Pilot 200 here. Moving on, so we're making progress. We're moving towards the vessel. Uh, can, can everyone see the picture? Are they showing okay? Yeah, they are. Okay, perfect. And then, there we are here. We're close to the. Uh, posterolateral lateral branch, you may see there is uh, a little bit of stain into the septum, mm -hmm. which is not a big deal. Um, there are some cases, case reports, where you get hematomas compressing the septum, etc. But actually, here it's not; um, it, it doesn't look too bad. So here's the stingray, not a poor, good view. You can see the two rails, so not the best view for the entering. Um, and the long story, Sergius failed again. And after multiple attempts, you used the stick and swap using the Pilot 200. Didn't work out with the bobsled going further down. We just couldn't re-enter the vessel. It was a very small vessel. And as a last attempt, we did start. And seemed as if we went uh, into the distal true lumen. 
So we ballooned with a 1.5 balloon, and uh, this is what we saw afterwards. So I don't know if the projects are okay, no, but can yeah. everyone see something uh, floating on the... Yeah, there is a cross-section of contrast. Yeah, and the pericardium looks like you have a, a perf. So it was interesting. Initially, when I saw this, the patient was little, completely fine, no hemodynamic issues. I'm like, maybe we're in a cavity. You know, there's a wishful thinking sometimes. Yeah. But uh, then when you take this picture, I mean, that's pretty convincing. And what is interesting to me, at least in this one, is the first time to perforate with a knuckle. People say, you know, a knuckle is a fairly safe way to go down and uh, unlikely to perforate because you don't have a stiff end of the wire. Mm -hmm. But as you can see here, you can still do it. Which wire is this? Um, I think this is a, a filter XT um, filter XT wire. Yeah. So it's before we, we're going to change this, and we want to balloon and then change the wire. We we'll get a bit of visualization to wire because it was a very small vessel. Sure, and your balloon was not even there, right? I mean, this is. Yeah, this is the knuckle. Yeah, we didn't go all the way out there on the balloon. Yeah. The balloon was. I think it was just a wire perf, but there was no flow until we opened the rest of the vessel with ballooning. So. Um, uh, what people do at this point? Well, I'll probably reverse the anticoagulation first. Mm. Yeah, that's a, you know to be honest, that's a controversial point right now in terms of um, reversing. Because if you reverse and you have equipment in there, then chances are you're going to clot off everything. So you may end up with a different kind of problem. <clears throat> so you may end up with the same situation you started out with, which is a CT of the right. Which is okay, but it may propagate more proximal. And get some, and plus you don't have, you have to remove equipment, so you can get control distally. But I agree with you. That's something actually we did that later on during the case. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually kind of the, uh, kind of the book how you to handle this. So the first step is put a balloon, and stop the uh, stop the bleeding, which we did that. And then either put a coil for small vessel pair for a cover stand. Now this was a small vessel pair, obviously. So coil uh, would be the way to go. Now, we talk about the dual guide technique to treat large vessel perfs, but uh, for this one, we didn't really think much about it. We haven't done any dual guide technique. Usually, you just use the same guide, and you put microcaster and then deliver coils or clots or fat or something. By the way, anyone has a, a micro a beads or a micro particles in their lab? So very useful, and if you don't have them, three to four hundred microns are the ones to have. Uh, just in cases like this, if the calls don't work, there might be something very useful. Okay. So in any case, what we did here, which was interesting, we try with the balloon in, and then we thought, you know, why not just put a microcatheter next to the balloon? It's an H-friends guide, so enough space. So this way, we're preventing bleeding. There's no increase in the pericardial effusion size. At the same time, we have all the time in the world to put our coils and deliver and, and potentially stop the bleeding there. So what you are seeing here is, um, again, a balloon inflated in the mid-right. Mm -hmm. And then we would try to, another actually lesson I learned, we used a renegade and couldn't deliver it. So for those of you who have renegades, renegade is very flimsy, which apparently is on purpose to be very tortuous and navigate to tortuosity. The issue is it's not very deliverable. Mm -hmm. So we finally, this is a prograde 2.8 friends that we're able to get down, and it's actually very close to the to the perforation. And actually, the balloon is over a second wire because I, I could not rewire with another wire all the way down there. So I kept the first wire into that space, got the second wire, got the balloon over the second wire, and now I have the balloon blocking the microcatheter there. Which microcatheter is that? So this is a 2.8 prograde. It's a Terumo, okay. terumo microcatheter. Okay. But again, there, there are multiple. You can use a transit, whatever you have, as long as you know them ahead of time. What happens if you don't have them, then it's hard to figure out which one. You cannot use a, a Corsair or a fine cross because they're not big enough for the coils. Yeah, that's that's the point that I, I was going to make about it. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So you, you don't want, you want a bigger microcatheter. And this is delivering the first coil. I don't know if it projects okay, but if you look carefully what's happening in the screen, you may notice something unusual. 
which I'm embarrassed to admit we did, but there it is. So if you look at it, you see the coil is coming out, and then, it's and, the, and then if you see there's something else continuing to come out. So this is the back end of an 014 wire that we use to deliver a, this is a micro coil, a figure eight micro coil. So unfortunately, the coil that went out, but then the wire kept on going out, and you can see it's flying out in the pericardium. So uh, I will discuss per coils, but the bottom line is if your coil is the ones that are pushable, not the detachable ones, then you may want to use uh, uh, the official thing is a 0.025 glide wire if you have it, or use something, a wire with a radio pick and so you can see where it's going. So you were, uh, I guess, the pushing both, I guess, the coil and the coronary guide wire that was inside the delivery catheter? That's what That's we're right, seeing? Right. Okay. The, the, the coil came out. You see the coil coming out right there? No. But then the wire keeps on going out as well. And, you know, in the heat of the moment, you don't really pay attention to details. So sometimes you cannot even realize. We actually realized this afterwards when we were reviewing the films. So we put a coil, this is the second coil, so we put a coil more distally, didn't do it. We put a more proximal coil. The nice thing we had is we can inject through the microcaster here, so we can see exactly what was going on. No need to deflate the balloon. So the balloon was up the whole time. So as you can see here, we're uh, actually, I think, yeah, this injection from microcaster, you can see there's still flow, um, extravasation um, over, through that uh, perforation spot. And then we took a, a larger one. This is a two centimeter by two millimeter um, coil. That's a detachable one. I'll show it to you in a second. That we put more proximally, trying to kind of block it. And this is a different kind of coil. It's called um, Azure. It has a polymer that swells over 20 minutes after you place it. So you can see now we're still uh, having some bleeding, but now, and that's probably half an hour later, and we have not reversed yet. Now you see that we are finally um, not having any more bleeding um, towards the end, very, very mild. And then later on, there was no, no more bleeding going on. So this is a 2 millimeter by 2 centimeter coil. That's the one that made a difference? Uh, correct. So the more proximal one. Yeah. Now eventually, actually, you can see there's actually flow through that coil, but maybe it stopped the flow enough that the yeah. more distal coil had a chance to clot off and stop the bleeding there. And here are the pictures. So this is the catheter we used finally. It's a prograde. It's 2.8 francs. I think there's a, there are two different kinds. So the, the larger one, the 2.8, is one you want. And then this is the first coil. It is a figure eight, two millimeters by five millimeters coil. Now, retrospectively, it might have been a little small. I think if we put the larger one from the beginning, mm -hmm you know, who might actually have gotten a better luck from the beginning. So it's deceiving. When you, see, you hear, you know, five millimeters, you see, wow, that's huge. But because it wraps around itself, it's not as big as we think. But in any case, this is one you have, and, you know, they do have these little um, fibers around them to make them more thrombogenic. And, again, this is what they recommend, is to use a 0.025 glide wire to push the coils out, or there are actually pre-made special pushers for coils that can be used for that purpose. And then this is the other one. Um, this is a pushable one, so you just push it the same way, and this is two millimeters by two centimeters. But the one we put actually is this one. Uh, it's actually two by two, um, two millimeter diameter by two centimeters. And if you remember, it's not that big. Once we deployed it, it was probably two, three millimeters in length. It really wrapped around itself a lot. And the way this works is you push the coil out, and it remains attached to the wire. And then if you are happy with the position, you put the wire into this uh, controller. You press a button. And after two seconds, the green light goes off, and that means that you release. So then the advantage there is you can put the coil. You don't like it. You can take it out, reposition, anything you like. So, I mean... Again, we were we were lucky when this happened. We had actually a representative there that helped the rumor app that helped us, uh, you know, deal with this. But because we don't do this routinely, at least you know, here in Dallas, we don't do this very often. 
and it happens during a stress, stressful moment, sure. it can be a little uh, challenging to get your act together and get things done on time. Now, this call, if I remember correctly, Manas, this comes with its own wire, right? The the one that you detach with the Correct. That one comes controller. with the wire. Exactly. Okay. That's, not, that's not the wire that, that flew into the pericardium. This, you had to exchange no, no, this the, is wire. the other wire. Okay. Exactly. Okay. The one that flew into the pericardium was this one. Correct. That comes with a little coil, and you have to push it with something. And we use the back end of the wire. But this, uh, and this one here that's detached. Correct. That is a wire, and you just push the wire down, and when you're happy, just press that, that button but, yeah. controller and releases it. So anyway, so many, I guess, lessons from this. The first one is that if you have a small vessel perf, unlike what we say for the large vessel perfs, you don't need a second guy to deal with this. If you have an eight friends guide in, you can have both a balloon to stop the flow, and you can also have the microcaster next to it to deliver your coils or whatever it is. There are some reports that if you don't have coils, you can pull negative suction uh, through the microcaster, and that can kind of collapse the vessel and help with clotting off that perforation a little bit. And the second is to know your coils and uh, be able to use them in a rush when you need them. Interestingly enough, here, we didn't actually need to uh, do pericardiosynthesis. There was a very small effusion. The patient was very stable, didn't have any symptoms. We repeated it in a couple hours. It was stable. So we didn't actually do a pericardiosynthesis in this patient. I guess the reason is because we were able to block the undergrade flow early on, and we had very limited um, extravasation. Did you proceed with the stenting after that? Uh, <laughs> no, that... Well, the problem is we didn't have outflow, right? Uh, the, the, the sad thing here was that, uh, I mean, there was some outflow, but we didn't have really much outflow distally. Mm -hmm. And now I have a uh, you know, coil distally, right? So where's the blood going to go? Yeah. So I doubt well, this is going to that stay is, That is in the PL, right? That's right. And the PDA we don't see? We don't see, but it's a very small vessel from the previous Correct. picture. Correct. So I agree with you. Maybe it, it might find some outflow eventually, but... Well, it it than, and the result is not bad with balloon only, but no, no, it looks better than when, when you started. <laughs> but anyway, obviously at this moment we're not thinking in terms of maintaining patencies. Like I know, I know. The quicker you close it, the better it is. But again, happy end, but it can be stressful. The other thing in my mind here that's important: the smaller the distal vessel it is, the more careful you're going to go after you cross with your wires. You know, your PDA usually have a lot of room to go, but here. You don't have enough room, you may get in trouble. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has similar situations um, uh, in the past, but this is again one of those examples of small vessel per. Okay, so moving on to another case. As you may know, they're launching the Gaia wires in the US. So effective January there will be in a limited release, and hopefully during the remaining of the year, Gaia's um, are going to be available. So yesterday they were in the lab, and we're doing some initial evaluation. So I want to show you the first case I did with um, with the Gaia. This is an LAD CTO. You see a nice little stump. Previous bypass space in Lima was never used for the LAD. Um, I think at the time there was no much disease in the LAD. And the LAD actually fills by collaterals from the PDA that fills from this vein graft to the PDA. Does not look extremely impressive in terms of size and caliber, but being an LAD and he's, uh, he's a man, he's I think like 60-something six, um, year old man, so it has to be a decent sized vessel. And he had an open graft uh, going to an obtuse marginal branch that gave what seems to be like a diagonal. Mm -hmm. So again, vein graft to PDA is fine. Vein graft to the OM is fine. Um, Lima not used, but the risk of free two cabots is fairly high, so that's why they asked us to go and try to even open the LAD. So I don't know if you have any thoughts regarding how to approach this. So it's a fairly long occlusion. It's from the beginning of the LAD, and the reconstitution is in the mid to distal um, segment. Well, I think you probably want to go anti-grade first if you have a 
what you think it is a stump that you can uh, engage with a wire. Uh, it's probably going to need at some point a section reentry or a cross boss. Um, and I would think the second guy will probably go to the vein graph to the right to guide your procedure in case you need to go retrograde. Exactly. So that's what our thought as well. I think it wouldn't be a reasonable to start retrograde here, giving such a long occlusion. But again, we're evaluating the new wires, and uh, we thought it's worth a try under grade anyway. So, again, this is um, 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 the first step. It was very hard to get in the LAD. There's a knob, but the guy wasn't sitting very well. Do you find in these cases, I know that Japanese do a lot of firewalls in the circ to guide the puncture of the LED. Do, do you find that useful? Yeah, you know, it, I mean, if, if I didn't know what was going on, sure. But I think here you have a very nice knob. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, I don't think it would help as much. But in other cases where it's unclear, I think it's a nice thing to do and helps you understand where to go. Having said that, what they do where they park the IVUS there and they cross under IVUS guidance, that, at least in my experience, has been very hard to do because the IVUS doesn't stay there. And that, that has been my experience, too, and I, um, yeah. Yeah, so you may be able to do it, but it's usually you just try to poke the wire first, and then once the wire is in a spot you think might be the one, then you get the eyeballs to take a look and then go back and forth. But in any case, here you see the, the venture is going back and forth, um, and then we'll put the Gaia wire in. So for those of you who haven't seen how they are, Gaia is the same construction as the Sion which is, the, they call it Act 1 technology. There is the core that goes all the way from the back end all the way to the tip. And then at the distal part, it has two coils. The outside coil, which all wires have, but has a second coil on the inside. And they say it's that inside uh, coil that makes the one-to-one -one torque transmission being possible. But unlike the Sion, it doesn't have two cores because of the tapering distally. So it's a single core, but has two coils and comes in two flavors, I'm sorry, three flavors. One is the first, they call it Gaia first, tapers at 0 0.010, 1.7 grams. Gaia second, 0 0.011 and 3.5 grams. And Gaia third is 0 0.012 taper and 4.5 grams. Now, my, from yesterday and what I'm hearing from other people, the Gaia second is kind of the more commonly used one. Mm -hmm. like the best balance of stiffness and penetration. And um, what they're saying, and I, did, I, did, I must say it was true, these wires you don't treat as the other wires. You have to be a little more patient with them. So you you go in, the wire will deflect if it goes to the wrong direction, and then you turn it, wait for a couple of seconds, the wiring is going to rotate. And I must say, in this case, it was impressive how it was turning. Uh, I would turn it a little bit, and I could see the tip turn. Advance, turn a little bit, the tip will turn. So it did have very good control, I must say. So it's a very different philosophy than the current one, where you just you know, jam a wire in, and if it doesn't go, we knuckle it and go all the way down. This is more the Japanese style, where you just take your time and redirect, see where the vessel should be, and keep on going. So to be honest, my, my expectation of this working was very low, because it was pretty long occlusion. But figure, let's give it a try. So here it is, the ventral catheter in, and you see the Gaia second is going in. And uh, to my surprise, they kept on going. And this is like 10 minutes later. And again, here we're not, we're in a subminimal space somewhere, so actually I pulled it back and redirected. And you see, we're subminimal, but still, with a single wire and having parked the microcatheter all the way to the ostium, we're able to come all the way down to here. So I must say, it, it, this is, I think it's going to be a big game changer. This wire does have some unique characteristics compared to what we currently know. So at this stage, we were trying to, we thought we would just go in, change this for a different wire, and then maybe do a stingray re-entry or something else. However, we couldn't advance the balloon in, and uh, we did grenadoplasty. The balloon ruptured on the way out, it pulled the wire out. So we're starting all over again. And this time, we're running out of wires because we only had a limited selection for yesterday. We use a guy a third. Did track to some degree, but you can see now it's kind of in a funny spot. It's away away from the other vessel. And finally, around four gray, we decided to switch to retrograde because we're not getting anywhere. 
So very calcified, very hard to advance proximal. And here we're retrograding, seen everything, but uh, this is retrograde from the septal collateral, which surprisingly with the seen wire went all the way easily back, all the way to the middle AD. So we have this wire undergrade, we have the retrograde. Um, I didn't see it, but we did have a, a, we put in a Corsair and did the guideliner, I'm sorry, put a guideline with the guideliner reverse card and externalize the wire. Again, wire placement. And this is how it looks after we put a couple stents there. I know what you're thinking. I'm not happy. <laughs> this is four hours later. <laughs> yeah, it's been it, 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 it a couple of hours, couple of hours later, and yeah. I mean a lot of effort and energy, and not very happy. Now, when this happens, when you stand and you don't get flow, I mean chances are either you're subminimal, you didn't realize it. But here we had a very nice retrograde crossing, so I was fairly confident we were true lumen at least distally. And the you see the septals too. You see the septals, you know, when you stand it, I think that also, you have right, yeah, non-amputated exactly. septals. Oh, that's not going to be 100%, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's favorable. favorable. But I but think I the most common thing is you, you dissect distally. Mm -hmm. So usually putting a small stand covering distally would help you um, restore the flow. The small balloon, actually, we did put a small 2 to 5 uh, uh, stand distally. You know, now we do have the flow go all the way down, but the vessel obviously doesn't look the greatest, but at least we have flow now. And another thing that we got burned recently is um, once you have this very complicated uh, submintimal course, we used to go very high pressures and expand it very nicely, and we ran into a perf. So when we do submintimal standing, we try to, I mean, we still go 20, but we just don't go 30. To try to prevent any dissections or any perforations. So did this anyway. We finally put nitrates uh, through a twin pass down there. Um, we didn't want to stand anymore, but this is how it looks at the end. So not the best in the world, but we decided there's not much more we can do at this point, and we'll let it uh, heal and probably bring it back in a few months to see if the remains patent and it can be optimized. So quite often these vessels will grow up over time when you restore flow and get better. Although, again, we'd obviously love to see a little better flow at the end. So I guess the, the take home for this one is, you know, guys are going to be a great addition, I think, to what we have for wires and how they're going to change the algorithms we use now, which is go from, you know, the Filter XT, go to Pilot or Confianza. I think probably they replace Confianza. So but you will you will upgrade after your your pilot 200. Yeah, I think you, after you the XT, if we want to be stiff, then probably that's the one to use over here. Yeah. Apparently in Japan, what I'm being told is in Japan half the operators actually start with the Gaia, and the other half start with the polymer filter XT and then and then escalate it to a Gaia. Now in the U.S., you know, given we're in an impatient crowd and we like to move fast. It remains to be seen how the wires will be used, but I do think uh, they're going to be useful. And actually, what I didn't show you, I didn't uh, couldn't take a fluorescent store, the reverse card was not bad. It was easy with uh, the Gaia. It went fairly okay into the guideliner catheter. Okay, and here's another case. So this is an interesting case. How many of you have seen aneurysms like this in, the, in a vein graph? Well, not is exactly that a like stent that. fracture or is that just two stents? Yeah, this is two stents. Um, and you're right, it's a, a weird one. The first stent, the flow goes to the first stent. The second stent, the flow goes outside and then comes back in. So I think there's a huge aneurysm there. And the stent is partially occluded, but then it canalizes distally. You're, you're right, it's a very weird, um, uh, you know, very weird anatomy. But this, this aneurysm has apparently been growing over time. And so, so it's not within the stent, he could be a diva. I'm joking. 
<laughs> and actually, these are wall stands. I don't know if you can tell them. These are wall stands, like many years ago. You know, you can see the calcium, actually. I would look at the report and make sure that this was not one long stand and that it fractured. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. You know, unfortunately, this is like that many years ago, so we don't have any old films, but that's a good point. I wonder if it could have been um, a detachment of the stand. That's great. But I guess, the, so the points on this, he was sent to us for two reasons. One is uh, for ants, and the second is because they were worried the aneurysm is growing. The patient is not a candidate for reduced surgery. He has an open lima and an open vein graft to the... Um, to the OM. So the, what they want to do is close the graft to avoid rupture and improve angina, but at the same time, um, they tried actually to go, um, and this is the right, you see the right, native right, they tried to go retrograde through the graft. I'm not sure what caster they're using here, it's an over the wire caster, uh, but they couldn't get the caster to go through the strut, uh, the stents of the strut, the struts of the stent. So an interesting, um, interesting aneurysm. Is he having any symptoms, Manos, from this? He's having exertional angina. Hmm. But again, I mean, you see there is flow, so I'm, I'm not sure yeah. how much of it is caused by by the vein itself or from a distal disease. There's this uh, tight, if you go back, there's this tight lesion into the PDA proximal to the anastomosis as well. The native right. So you see the uh, graft that is down and then going back, uh, there is um, yeah. this, this tight lesion. I'm sorry. That's right. Oops, okay. Okay, so... Any thoughts? So again, he's not a candidate for surgery. And they tried once to go retrograde through this graft to open the native, and they couldn't get the microcatheter to follow through the retrograde guide wire. And the right is what you see is what you get. There is nothing coming from the left side in form of collaterals. Uh, there is not, but I'm going to show you actually the dual. So what I was hoping is... Uh, if I can understand, uh, if I can read you, I think I was hoping there's some collateral from the native uh, uh, left system mm -hmm. that I could use to go retrograde and avoid the graft altogether mm -hmm. and not have to worry about it. Unfortunately, as you can see over here, there are collaterals, but they're not good enough quality. Uh, I mean, we tried, but they just didn't connect down to the to the PDA. I think the flow was on the graft was probably too good. So that didn't work out, and this is the other dual. So now we're injecting, um, actually it's a triple, so we've got a radial as well. So we're injecting one caster, one guide in the left main, second guide is in the native right, and a third multi is into the vein graft. So again, very long occlusion. Uh, the left collaterals don't actually go to the PDA. They seem to go to an acute marginal branch or something like that. And the vessel is very calcified and very diseased. Well, whoever is sending these patients to you doesn't like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is you know, these are interesting, interesting people. Yeah. Um, so how do you approach it? So anyway, and we didn't, you know, unfortunately, the machine we have now doesn't have fluorostore. So what we first did is try to go retrograde from the vein graft again. Just I was curious, to be honest, can I get the Corsair through this? Mm -hmm. And actually, Corsair went through this, no problem. I mean, pushed, but went. And then took it all the way down to the anastomosis, but then could not cross retrograde. I was able to get a venture down there, and they still could not cross because of the tight lesions, especially the mid, get the wire to the mid lesion, and then it would stop. So essentially, I could not go retrograde. I was hoping to go retrograde and then knuckle and take it all the way up, but unfortunately, could not get that done. And then when, when that happened, then the only other way left was to go undergrade and go dissection reentry. 
and we had a hard time. You know, it's, it's a big band, but finally this caudal, it's like an area caudal view, shows how the right is, is curving. Mm -hmm. So you're just able to get that wire, and those are, I think those are pilot, to follow this little dissection on the top. And then finally got a knuckle started, and then switched for the crossboss. And here is the crossboss. Now, we, I mean, we're a few hours in the case now, I think, or at least a couple of three hours in the case at this point. So you cross the lesion with the wire, not with the crossboss? No, no. Or, or a combination of both. So, so, but, but look at where the crossboss is. Yeah, it's somewhere in this. So yeah. it's in a, in a side branch. Actually, the crossboss, unfortunately, for our good luck, went into an acute margin or something like that, because the, the right is supposed to be somewhere back there. Um, so we ended up coming back, and uh, we used several knuckles to try to follow across what we thought was going to be the graph, and the native coronary, I mean, and finally, you can see now we are dancing in sync with the distal uh, right coronary. Mm -hmm. So Corsair is all the way down, and we have a knuckle. I think it's a pilot 200, and trying to get there. And at this point, we're trying, okay, let's try to do the entry. So we have a stingray balloon, and doing stick and swap. We must have done at least 30 or 40 attempts. Uh, move the stingray back and down, and the long story short, couldn't re-enter. And finally knuckled all the way to the touchdown of the graph. Put a wire under grade into the PDA just in case we cause any damage. And then uh, finally got the stingray to go all the way almost down to the vein graph. And then um, uh, did stick and swap again. And finally, you can see the wire now crossed back into the, uh, into the vein graph. So we now have an under grade wire all the way down. Uh, that's crossed through the vein graft. And I think the vein graft was not diseased down there, so we were we were okay with that. Uh, put a stand, trying to just get it right into the, um, essentially the neck of the vein graft touching down. And that seems to be okay. And then put stands through the whole thing. It was five uh, 38 millimeter stands. Wow. So that was. Oh, you got it. That was a fairly long, long occlusion. At this point, what we were hoping to do is get a wire undergrade and just treat this ISR lesion distally. Yeah. And we finally got the wire, but could not get the liver anything, anything going this way. So eventually, uh, after trying, uh, tried to deliver a stand through the stand, also the the wall stand, and that didn't happen either. So anyway, in the end, I think we just gave up and said, you know, that looks good enough, and um, and we sent him and we sent him out. Now we were hoping to actually coil the vein graft at the end of this. Yeah. So this is like a five-hour case. We're like close to eight gray, so we decided to just leave him alone, and at a different time he can come back and we can coil it. Not uh, need to be done right now. So I think th this one the. I guess it's an interesting case because of the many challenges. You have essentially crossed a very long lesion, and you can see now, actually, this is the vessel. Remember the crossbow was somewhere? This is where it was. You see that thing lighting on the bottom? Yeah. So I think it was an acute marginal branch that we got in, and anyway, you want to recognize it before you perf that little thing if you keep on pushing. So again, we had to do the sexual reentry, we had to redirect with knuckle a lot. A lot of uh, stick and swap, and finally had to go to that big segment and do stick and swap and, and get it in uh, eventually. So fairly long, uh, long, painful case, but the standard principles still apply. I mean, it was just a dissectory entry yeah. with long segment and uh, complicated uh, uh, stingray-based reentry. No, I mean it looks it looks great. I, to be honest with you, I wasn't very optimistic at the beginning. Um, well, neither were we. Yeah. But you know, this is the these are outside uh, referrals, and we you know, try to make sure we do everything we can when these people, um, you know, people come from outside. Yeah. Did you think about uh, just putting a cover stand in the vein graph? I mean, the, the objective here is try to prevent a rupture of the vein graph and perhaps treat ischemia in that PDA with a balloon and just cover the aneurysm with a, a cover stand. Yeah, that would be awesome. 
Again, the challenge might be we couldn't deliver a regular stand. We couldn't deliver anything. Stand, anything. So cover stand might be a little challenging. But I think you're right. I mean, that would be the ideal um, way to do it. I think you avoid the risk uh, for putting coils there. And you're still probably prone to thrombose it when you stop the outflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think probably that would be the, the better way. But again, here, um, we'll see how it heals. I think the angle is what is going to be the challenging part. Maybe if we put a stiff wire and straighten it out, that might help a little bit. But um, we don't know. We don't know for sure yet. So again, exa example of hybrid technique. So that's, I guess, that's all uh, all for now. So you see the field is changing very rapidly. Um, any thoughts, comments, any other things uh, happening? No, great, Casey. Thank you, thank you, John. I appreciate you you joining today. Um, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned any uh, for people on the call. Uh, any of you have coronary uh, using much coronary laser? Because it looks like we'll have a coronary laser VA study launching in the next, uh, in the early next year, and we're we'll trying to look at people who are doing it, so um, can get some collect some information on how people are using it and uh, what the outcomes are. I don't know if uh, any of you uses much. We we, do, we don't have it in Minneapolis. We don't. Okay. How about we do you? have it, but we haven't used it very much. Uh, Aunt Topaz used to use it, but when he left, you know. People weren't very keen to you, but we have it. So just for the information, we do have it. Okay, okay, that's perfect. Yeah, I mean, we're still looking for uh, people to, to use this. And to be honest, we weren't using it that much ourselves. But <laughs> lately, with the CTOs and this balloon yeah, enforceable, yeah, yeah, I agree. that's becoming like the case I saw you, one of the cases I showed you, mm -hmm. the one with the guy, I mean, we literally burst like 10 balloons and couldn't get it going, and finally, uh, Tornus wouldn't go, and finally, with the laser, um, we were able to get the channel, get the balloon in, and, uh, and finish the case. So, in select cases, it can be it can be very useful, especially for CTOs. Okay. Yeah, Skip is, has some, is a little more of an enthusiasm of laser. All right. Thanks a lot. Exactly. Excellent. Thank you, John. Again, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being on the call. Thanks very much, Santiago, for moderating. And um, uh, again, we welcome you. If you have, you can show any cases. Probably we'll schedule the next one in the next couple of months, uh, in February or March of next year. Any um, thoughts or any any case you'd like to show or discuss, uh, Mr. Santiago and I? And <coughs> sure, I have, I'll, I'll send you a few cases for the next one. And I mean, I don't know. At some point, I, I wanted to ask the question, perhaps to all the the docs on the on the conference. And once we have enough tower centers at the VA, we should probably start thinking about doing something similar with the structural cases where we could present towers and perhaps micro clips for people to, to discuss. Do you think that may be something um, of interest to all of you? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea, Santiago. I think something that's needed and uh, we're early in the States, but you're right, more and more uh, centers are having it and more and more people are getting it. So. I think, I think we are like uh, there are five or six BAs that are already approved doing this, and it's also I guess an opportunity for you know to show what you guys are doing and perhaps to get referrals from other BAs that may be close by and that are not send, you know sending these patients to the private sector perhaps um, <clears throat> because these patients you know most of them are you know stable and they can certainly travel a short distance and um, it's just a thought. Okay, sounds perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, so thank to everyone. Happy holidays and happy 2015. Yeah, happy happy holidays. And happy Likewise. Likewise. Full okay. successful CTOs. Thank you, without complications. There you go. <laughs> Bye now. I guess I'll see, you, I'll see you in the preserve call now in 15 minutes. No, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.